Hello and thank you for joining me on my Highlander experience. This video was compiled for Fielding Graduate University, a requirement for my 815 course, Transformative Learning. My name is Kimberly Corris and I'm a PhD student focusing on human development. Today I'm going to share an amazing experience I had at the Highlander Research and Education Center in Tennessee. It's formerly known as the Highlander Folk School. This trip was offered by my school, Fielding Graduate University, as an extracurricular trip. Uh, and I really wanted to go. Um, I'm from a small town in Central California, a small beach town, and so I felt very removed from anything that had to do with civil rights, um, the civil rights movement, and I'd never been to the South. This was a wonderful opportunity for me to kind of step outside of myself. So I did mention that I was able to couple this trip with a course, Transformative Learning, but I didn't go to Highlander expecting to be transformed or, or else this whole thing would be wrapped up in a neat little bow and boom, done, right? <laughs> I'd been on other school trips with Fielding and I was somewhat awkward and shy. I didn't go like with a best friend or a group of best friends. And so when it came to connecting with people, it was hard for me. Uh, but this trip, I was determined to put my best foot forward uh, and just go for it. <laughs> it was a five-day trip, and uh, it was going to be a long way from home. I didn't want to just sit in my room at night, you know, and uh, think about what I could be doing. So, uh, so I went for it. Because this is for school, I needed to uh, include some scholarly information. I liked the structural development approach to transformation and I felt that it applied to me both before and after. Um, this approach to transformation is defined as a shift to a different stage of development or perhaps a higher order of consciousness. It involves changes in our ways of making meaning towards more inclusive, integrative, and complex ways of knowing. Learning in this approach gives us an opportunity to step outside ourselves, participate without the fear of recrimination from anyone. Our group was diverse, small, and willing to learn and grow together. We all had something to bring to the table, and the camaraderie built in those five days created a foundation that, and a friendship that enabled us to continue learning still. We can't begin to talk about the Highlander Research and Education Center without talking first about its founder, Miles Horton, and some of the history of Highlander. Miles Horton was born in Savannah, Tennessee in 1905. His parents were school teachers and instilled a love of God and community in him. They were poor working people and he had to go away to work to attend high school and then college. During the summer, he was able to get a job teaching Bible classes to the poor mountain people for the Presbyterian Church. This had a profound effect on him and helped him decide what he was going to do for the rest of his life. Miles was educated at University and Union Theological Seminary in New York. He traveled to Denmark in the 20s to investigate the Danish folk schools an institution where ordinary people learned everything from agricultural methods to how to read. These folk schools were created by Nikolaj Grundtvig, who was a Danish pastor, author, poet, philosopher, historian, teacher, and politician. He called his vision for these schools popular education. The idea was to give the peasantry and lowborn an education that they could value and use. So, not one of reading and formal education, but one of the living word, including their language, history of the fatherland, its constitution, industries like farming, folk songs, and principles based on their Christian framework. The Danish folk schools were based on popular education, and this sparked something in Miles Horton. 
Upon return to the United States, he looked for a place to start something loosely based on this idea. You know, he'd been disillusioned in college, experiencing racism against friends he had made and pushback with the interracial meetings he regularly held at the YMCA. He found a retired college professor named Dr. Lillian Johnson, who donated her mountaintop land in Grundy County to the cause. And in 1932, the Highlander Folk School was founded. Horton was highly influenced by John Dewey's writings, stating that civil and political democracy were meaningless without equivalent industrial and economic democracy. This supported the reality that Horton experienced in Tennessee. Soon after Highlander opened, Miles Horton heard about the miner strike in Wilder some 100 miles away. He went to help and was appalled to find starving people with no electricity and no running water. So remember, this was a time when the company provided everything for the miners. Housing, stores to buy their goods, and they were paid in company script, not U.S. dollars. So they could only purchase from the company store. The mine owner, the Fentress Coal and Coke Company in Wilder, Tennessee, cut wages for the third time and brought in workers from other areas to work for less pay. Horton and the Highlander staff wrote letters, gave speeches, asking for donations of clothing and food for the miners and their families. The strike went on for a year and it was volatile. Horton warned the leader of the strike to leave for fear of violence. Unfortunately, that man, Barney Graham, was murdered and the strike lost a lot of steam after that. But the Highlander Folk School, they were just getting started. Horton worked very hard on integrating the workshops at Highlander. They had their first black workshop speaker in 1934, but workshops were not fully integrated until 1942. The staff at Highlander was convinced that to succeed in the labor movement, they would need to address issues about racism and segregation. Highlander took everything it had about leadership and organizing to their civil rights work. They brought the culture of the people into learning by singing and helping them gain equity and democracy by learning to read so they could vote. They were an integral part of helping our civil rights leaders mobilize the people by training so many and having them go out and train more. A huge piece of this history is Esau Jenkins and Septima Clark who started the citizenship schools and allowing black people to learn enough to register to vote and finally have a say. What they didn't count on was the government labeling them communists and finally in 1959 shuttering the school and pulling their charter and seizing the land. All in silence were born in jail and no Money for a good teachers and domestics walked together to jail and got to know each other in the cells as they sat next to each other and felt, breathed and slept the passion that they had about their own desires to be free. But more than that, they came to know each other as people and not as classes, not as a doctor, not as a doctor's wife, not as a domestic, but as a person. And in the cells that how some 700 of Albany citizens grew a bond of togetherness which has characterized Albany more than anything else. They were there, unifying themselves as one, getting to know each other. And we come back to the community, and it's not the same anymore. You find people walking together, talking together, people that would think they would never speak to this person or that person.
Miles Horton and the staff at Highlander fought a lot of uphill battles. I believe they felt that those were the ones worth fighting for, and I agree. The rich history is palpable once you set foot on the property. It's magical and daunting all at once. When we arrived, we were immediately set upon by staff making sure we had everything that we needed, and then we were left alone to embrace the humidity and circadian. Coming from Los Angeles, I was certainly in unknown territory and ready to absorb as much as I could in five days. All right, who doesn't love to rock in a rocking chair? The idle sway, the more focused rock as the conversation gets interesting. It sets an amazing stage for our learning. We were in a round room that had been visited by more innovative and inspirational people than I could hope to meet in a lifetime. That was where our base camp was for learning. academics learn to work with communities. It's defined as a collective process of investigation, empowerment, and action. It was explained to us wonderfully by Susan Williams, who tied in the process of the citizenship schools for us.
Esau, had, Esau would carry people into Charleston in his van, and he had tried to run for office on John's Island and had not been able to win because black people couldn't vote because they weren't registered because they were barred from registering and there was literacy tests that kept them from. Anyway, they came to the workshop, and so they were supposed to be talking about the UN Declaration of Human Rights and why is that important? And Esau starts talking about, well, he didn't know about that, but the truth was, how were they ever going to have any rights if they couldn't have any political power, and they couldn't have any political power unless they would be able to vote. So they sort of, the workshop kind of veered off to talk about that. But, so Heider and Septima, who was a teacher, said, well, maybe there's something we can do down at John's Island. So for a while, they started sort of thinking about it. They talked about it some while they were there. They went down to John's Island. I mean, Esau lived there. Septima would go back and forth, and they talked about how can we do this, where would we do it. They had to build a little secret room in the back of the Progressive Club so that people wouldn't know they were back there doing a school. Um, the Progressive Club was sort of a co-op. So they had to design a place and recognize the danger. But um, they decided to try to do literacy schools. So Septon helped lead that, Esau helped lead that, how many people came down, they raised some money, and they started the school. And so Bernice Robinson, um, they got her to be the teacher, but she wasn't a teacher. So she said, I wasn't a teacher, so I didn't intimidate people, and I just talked to people what did they want to learn, and then I tried to figure out how to help them learn. And so she uh, basically did the school on John's Island, and they did things like learn to write their names, learn to uh, fill out you know, the order form for Sue's catalog, things that were practically used for them right then, but also what words did you have to know to be able to pass this test to be able to register to vote. And if you look at the workbook, it's incredible what people learn. And it's kind of a miracle to me that this actually happened. So she led the school in John's Island. Septim, Septim was a teacher. She was a teacher, so she was self-advising. And it was really successful. Um, a lot of people got registered to vote. They also learned to read and develop more community relationships. And so it was very powerful. So the next island, Wadmala, decided they wanted to do it too. So Bernice and, and Septim helped train um, school name, I can't remember, who was a leader on Wadmala to be the teacher there. And that was really successful. So then some other local islands wanted to do it too. In the meantime, so people who people could come to the school, they were registering to vote. And then so Highlander also started a second step leadership party. So I'm just trying to like this kind of process where you don't know the end, but you're trying, there's a goal you're trying to achieve. So they started a second step leadership program, which would bring people there after they had gone through the citizenship schools to help, in, help think about what else can we do in terms of increasing political power. So, so much had happened at Highlander, and the land was a huge part of it. It was a safe haven to learn, grow, and pass on the idea of equitable democracy. The original site that was seized in 1959 and sold off had been purchased by the Tennessee Preservation Trust, which is now trying to raise money to secure the property and convert it to something that would be permanently open to the public. What's interesting is there's a question about who the land actually belongs to and it's in court proceedings. So, while Dr. Lillian Johnson originally gave the property to uh, Miles Horton and Highlander in the 30s, you know, originally it belonged to the Native peoples. And this is an interesting issue that Highlander is fighting to solve and they're in the courts right now. So more shall be revealed on this. Highlander is trying to solve this equitably for all. We went on a land tour to learn about the different buildings and parcels attached to the Highlander property. It's 181 acres. During the next short clip, please pay attention to the wonderful artwork. We found it hung all through the children's camp dorm. I don't remember camp being so wonderful. We also got a peek inside the windows of the old library. I have a picture of Dr. Martin Luther King there. Even the grass had a vibration to it you could feel when you took your shoes off. It was amazing. It was an amazing place.
wasn't all work at Highlander. We did a little shopping, went to the Coal Creek Miners Museum, and we were even treated to the Mum Billies for some square dancing. Or I actually did some square falling, but it's all in the video. This is called In Jesus' Name. This is what I started last night and could not finish because I forgot words. <laughs> it's really low. So it's really low. Lord has called us to this place. Here we meet God face to face as we gather. In Jesus' name. We come with joys, we come with fears. We learn to share our laughs and tears as we gather in Jesus' name. The Lord has called us to this place to receive God's peace and grace as we gather in Jesus' name. Old ones laugh, the baby cries. And we know the Spirit thrives as we worship in Jesus' name. We all pray the children sing. We give a grateful offering as we worship in Jesus' name. We give ourselves with faults and flaws. By we loved by the God of all as we worship in Jesus' name. I mean, I'm just interested to know how how you got started doing this, and and is this you know is this in your runs in your family, or you just do this for a hobby, or this is part of your culture, or what what's up? Yes, yes. Okay, well then we're done. <laughs> Cat Blaine was telling somebody earlier, there's a large group of people in Knoxville that started playing, gosh, a long time ago. And, uh, and they, this has kind of grown and grown and grown over the years. We, welcome all comers, and we've all we what? just played music. Wide open. Yeah. It's, 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 the, uh, it's the origin of the Mumbilly name documented somewhere. <laughs> uh, it's with it's, about Mumble. This is your opportunity, uh, right? Uh, Yep. We used to be called the Mumble and Hillbillies, but now we're just called the Mumbillies. The Mumbillies? Yeah. We, we played here at this uh, at Thailand for uh, at least 20 years. Wow. We did a lot of uh, for, uh, you know, groups. Uh-huh.
Uh -huh. and to experience a little bit of what is happening here. Sure. It always is a, uh, does heart good to know we've got things happening here. People being trained in just reflection and learning. Well, God and can that. be a big part of it. We actually we met with her on a Thursday, right? Yeah. Wednesday or Thursday, yeah. and that was just amazing. You know what a what an amazing spirit. Like most of the music we play, we play for a lot of dances, so we play a lot of this field dance. Lucky for us. I think Kenzo built this. Well, it's in your best interest to build your stage, right? Yeah. <laughs> Did you want to say anything? No, I think you're doing well. She's very shy. Well, we we just appreciate you so much, and thank you. We appreciate it real figures are some kind of a turning figure in some way or another. So this is the real. So this starts with partner across the set and you hook right elbows in the middle. So go ahead and do an elbow turn. Officially it's once and a half, but wherever you end up is going to work so we fine. Should end up here? I wouldn't worry too much about exactly where. But pick a side. If you're on that side, well, we're going to tell me where I'll end up there. <laughs> End up exactly where you are. You're good I'm a rule so you're gonna, follower. So each good. Okay. I'll give you some rules then. All right. So then we can work. We can go anywhere you want. With this. So after you turn by the elbow once around, you end up back on your side. Look for the second couple. I'm going to speak to the third couple okay. right here. You just had your right elbow was busy, right? So your left elbow is free. So hook the left elbow. Come back to the middle. Your right elbow. Uh, keep going and we're going to go, go right in the middle. Back to our partner. Oh, right. uh, oh, it's magical. Oh, so now we're not. Oh, so it's always easy. And then I go back. Wait, wait. 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 So look, I'll give you a hint, a hint to where we're going with this. This is a progressive dance. And we're here. Oh, oh, okay. Okay. And this, couple, this is a good place to do progressive dances, right? Progressive. Uh, it's progressive dances, but a new couple is going to end up at the top every now and then. But you're not done yet. You guys pay attention because yes. you're going to get yes. to do that. Yes. Yes. When you get to the bottom, take two hands across the set. And you're going to gallop up to the top here. Yeah. Any way that strikes you fancy. You want to go, go out back. the outsides. And the lines are going to follow. So follow, follow, her, follow her, follow her, follow her, follow her. The lines come on, follow her. And you hear, make it march across the middle. You touch the middle of the march right here. Yeah. All the way up. Yeah. All the way, all the way up. All the way up. It's like a crease. And this is how we get back to where we started. Oh, this is fun. Yeah. 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 You're never going to get it. Because I know. I'm going this way. I know, I know. I'm going to get it. 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 Sorry, we have poor listening skills. Yes, good. The caller's job in these kind of environments. In a... Let's bring our first couple back up to the top there. Because we're going to have a practice round. Okay. And I will prompt... Yeah, I will prompt the dance as we go through. And let me say a couple things. There's, there are really two basic rules. One is everybody having fun. Check. Okay. Good. Okay. And that ties with the second rule of, you know, don't get too hung up on doing it right. Because at the end of the evening, it's just the dance, right? If, if you're having fun, no one's getting hurt. Uh, yeah, 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 yeah. Yeah, yeah. No one's getting hurt. We all have a phone call. All right. Let's get the music going. Let's get All right. Let's take hands in one level. Let's start the dance. All right. Let's go down. Part of that.
Yeah. Fun? Yeah. You good? Whoop. Okay. Pause. I'm fine. <laughs> <laughs> okay. I'm going to sit this next one out. All right. Yeah. I am. Okay. All right. How's your knee, though? watched a movie on the Clinton 12 before coming on the trip and had some background history on what happened. But I was not prepared for the onslaught of emotions that overcame me walking through the museum. Quite frankly, I didn't know how I was supposed to react and I shared that. At first, I felt intense guilt. Guilt for being white and not knowing that this had happened guilt over knowing things like this still happened and not doing more about it. Those were my initial reactions and and I think they were normal reactions for me. You know, I actually left and went outside because I, I knew that it was selfish guilt, like guilt about me, and that's not what this was all about. So I came back in I went back through and I started experiencing the displays through the eyes of my friends that were there. 
and the stories told which, with such detail and clarity. And I imagine walking just a block, as those brave students did, and I was struck by how magnificent they were. I was incredibly grateful that I had never experienced anything like that. Desegregation as to high school students in that county should be effective of the present year of 1956. Well, Clinton was the first public high school that underwent court order desegregation. When they said that we would be attending Clinton High School, I thought nothing about it. I didn't think it would be any problems until that first day we started down the hill and that's when I saw a lot of people who were jeering and I knew that uh, there were going to be some problems. When more people came and, and the young boys started walking with signs, I began to wonder and think, well, maybe they're not going to accept us like I thought they were. They looked like they just wanted to grab us and throw us out. They didn't want us at all. I could just see the hate in their heart. From people spitting on them to pulling the hair, the 1,500 people standing on either side of the sidewalk calling them names every day just because they wanted to walk into school. The high school was eventually bombed. That was what finally made the news. Right now I'm standing in front of Clinton High School in Clinton, Tennessee. Last night was rocked by a bomb blast. These were just children wanting to go to school. They had been bused a long way to a black high school, and after Brown versus the Board of Education, they had the right to, and they wanted to. I'm telling you, that walk was, seemed like you were walking uh, a million miles to go to school down there. There was a uh, R of terror, really, uh, in town because of all these incidents, and for a period of time, the black parents kept their children out of school for fear of their safety. So the Reverend Paul Turner, the minister of the First Baptist Church, came up to Green McAdoo School and walked the black students down the hill to Clinton High School. As he was walking back to his church, he was followed by members of this mob and beaten very severely. When he was assaulted, suddenly it wasn't just a black problem anymore. And people who had not identified with those children, sadly, could identify with him. I remember the, uh, the, the day that he came and walked down the, to the school with us. And after we went into the school, I, we didn't know about the, the, the events that occurred to him in terms of being attacked. But in essence, it brought a little more light to the town and things started happening. Uh, uh, people got involved. Even though uh, we had to overcome mob violence and two years later, the bombing of the high school, the, the community still stood together to see that desegregation continued. I can't imagine how hard it was for them. I mean, you know, walking down this hill to go to Clinton High School with hatred blurred at them, how difficult that must have been. They had to brave uh, hostility and racism and violence to, to get to their school, and they did it. And then finally to commemorate that, the Green McAdoo Cultural Center and Museum was established. It's outstanding for the young people to know about it. My grandkids and my children, they know about it, but they probably had to go through it. This is a story of courage and hope and bravery that, that everybody in our country needs to know about. They championed the, the cause of the civil rights because they didn't give up. A lot of people say, well, man, you made history. Well, I said, well, I don't think I made history because at the time my parents said, you're going to school. And that was the law of the land. Since I went down to register, there's been bloodhounds in front of my door. We being harassed, and whether I work at home or wash, the bills go high and high. Everything to put me out of Ruval is being done, but I'll be right there fighting for freedom until God say enough done. We worked all of March 
and as was to be expected, there was more violence. Sam Block and Willie Peacock were shot at in front of the office one night as they were parked, having come back from the church where they were getting together a clothes shipment. White men drove up close by the car, took a shotgun and blasted through the windows, so close that the pellets didn't have chance to spread out, and luckily none of the four people in the car were injured. About a week later, a group of white men shot into a group of Negroes coming out of the Negro theater. And then finally, late in March, one of our workers, George Green, was shot at just as he entered his house, having returned home late at night from work in the office. That next morning, we gathered on the church steps at Wesley Methodist Church in Greenwood and started singing. Get on board, children, children, get on board. Children, children, get on board. Children, children, let's fight for human rights. We know as freedom fighters that we may go to jail. But when you fight for freedom, the Lord will go your bail. Get on board, children, children, get on board. And we sang and we sang and we sang. And people gathered around and finally we sang We Shall Overcome in a big circle. And I talked to them and explained to them why I thought we needed to walk downtown to do two things. To protest to City Hall about the shootings. Because any time unlicensed cars drive around the town, and subsequently shoot at Negroes with white people in the car, the police have to be implicitly involved. It doesn't seem to me possible that unlicensed cars with white men in them can drive around the Negro community and cause violence, and the police don't know about them. So we were going to protest to the police at City Hall and then go on to the courthouse to register another type of protest and try and register to vote. We never got to the courthouse. We were met at the police station with police dogs. They told us to turn around or the dog would be turned loose on them. I never thought that Greenwood peoples would treat Negroes that been around here, that nursed their children and cooked for them and farmed this land, that they would have those type of police that would put dogs on human. I was knocked off my feet the other day I saw a terrible thing happen. I saw him put a dog on a first class citizen, decent man, and told him he was a black son of a bitch. Kennedy is your God. I never will overcome it. A black son of a bitch. A man is not a son of a bitch. A man is a created being made in God's image. And when God made man, he said he was good. And I don't think no man ought to be on the police phone unless he know God. I don't think he is them ought to be among men's. We going up there without a pocket knife, and men coming out with guns and everything, mind me, with guns around like that. I think men that own the police force ought to be the best men. They ought to know God, and they ought to be able to love humanity. No man is fitting to be nothing, no police nothing, if he's not got the grace of God in him. Galatians 6, it read like this. And be not um, deceived. the clan had uh, set my dad's um, um, Elijah told where I can fire because he was one of the first black businesses in Huntsville. Wow. So um, he had an oil business and um, mechanic, he was a mechanic. And that, they gave him a lot of problems trying to purchase the building. But um, where I lived, like I said, you know, um, we had a large amount of clan that was in the area. And uh, every Sunday, Every Sunday night, they would burn crosses and mm -hmm. have their meetings. And where it was located was like, <laughs> it was like maybe two miles down below my house mm -hmm. of where I live. Wow. And um, one night, um, you know, because my, my, my dad would always try, my mom and dad would always try to make sure that we were, you know, home and not having to, you know, so we could be safe. And, uh, and I remember, you know, my uh, my older brothers and my dad had to sit up, you know, uh, Sunday night to make sure that we were protected. 
And uh, one Sunday we were coming from Delaware, and because my dad's originally from Delaware, we were coming from Delaware, and um, we were coming up the hill. And uh, it was myself, my sisters, my brothers, we all were in this little brown station wagon, we were coming up the hill. And I heard my dad say, because I, I was in the car, but I was in the back seat. But I heard my dad say, oh my God, what's up with that bright light? Mm-hmm. And, um, and my mom said, I don't know. And he goes, oh, he said, oh my God, we need to claim. He said, let's get these kids in the house. Let's, let's get up this room. And my dad pressed on the gas. And he was like, as soon as we, when, when that happened, he was like, I want you kids to go to bed. I want you to turn off the lights. Don't say anything. Don't do anything. And, I mean, he was just giving instructions, you know, what to do. At first, I didn't know what was happening. Okay. And then when I, when I looked up, you know, okay. and I looked out the window, and I saw these people in sheets and wow. stuff, and um, they were burning a cross. <laughs> wow. And I was like, I didn't know what it was, you know, and I was little, I was small. So our last night was filled with laughter and love. Actually, we laughed a lot through the whole trip. But we shared so many things, so many new experiences. That last night, our inhibitions were down and, well, (laughs) see for yourself. the depth or complexity of our differences. Intellectually, I was aware of the horrible injustices that are still felt by people of color every day. But I'm very detached from that. I hadn't walked through the Green McAdoo Center with a group of totally diverse people with whom I was so connected. I experienced my friend Deborah remember Ku Klux Klan terror attacks on her neighborhood as a small child. Things she hadn't thought about in 40 years. I walked the land and felt a connection with something older than words. It was like an electrical current jumping from each blade of grass to another. We rejoiced in the silliness of life with s'mores and music, singing and dancing, filling our evenings after emotional days. It was the understanding and personal awareness that more needs to be done and I need to stand up where I can be most effective. It was the knowing that I can be effective. I can share with people what I learned, convey the emotions I felt, and give them hope for a better tomorrow. This is what I took away from my Highlander journey. I would consider this a transformative experience, both cognitively and regarding Keegan's developmental stages. From interpersonal to
to institutional, allowing me to rise above my personal doubts and embrace the collective experience of the group.